This is your Feel Good Breakfast Show Expresso here on SABC3. Now, every day we hear of horrific murders of women and children or gross abuses happening behind closed doors, seemingly aggravated by the ongoing COVID-19 lockdown. Now, last month, President Cyril Ramaphosa said that gender-based violence is South Africa's second pandemic. And we want to understand why it is happening at such an alarming rate and why at all. And as we discuss relationships like we do every Monday, today we're asking what can we do about gender-based violence in South Africa? This morning we're joined by a via video call by long-standing feminist activist, uh, strategy director of the Wraith Foundation, Fatima Shaboudin, to help us discuss this important issue. Good morning, Fatima, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, it's good to be here. Fatima, let's start first by understanding what effect we're seeing uh, with regards to what gender-based violence against women and children is, is having on our communities and our homes. Well, we know that on the extreme end of the effect spectrum is deaths and rapes of women. So that's what's in the public domain and that's what's visible. That's what most of us are responding to. That's what the president has responded to. But the reality of gender-based violence is that its impact and its effects is on a spectrum on the very extreme side, it results in the death of women and children and their sexual violation. But on, on the other part of it, it's just the profound sense of insecurity and unfreedom. Me as a woman, when I wake up in this country every day, I need to have a strategy to navigate to the end of the day, to try and arrive there alive or not being raped. And so if you a man in this world, consider what that does to your, your brain, your well-being, your, your, your sense of freedom to move around in your house, in your community, in your country. Fatima, take us through it. What important work is being done in shelters to help alleviate the effects of the gender-based violence we are seeing right now? So look, shelters are crucial harbors for women who experience violence to be able to find safety, not to escape the onslaught of violence, but shelters in itself won't cure our gender-based violence. We do know that shelters are in an extreme position of crisis because they're so under-resourced by government. And so the reality is when women are beaten and they do need a place to go, those shelters literally provide life and death support. So there's a massive resource shortage to help us fund the fight against gender-based violence. And here we turn our attention both to government but also to the corporate sector we know that we, we've seen here from the pandemic uh, context that corporate South Africa came to the party in some way to help us resource the response to the crisis. And we're asking very hard questions about where corporate South Africa is when at least half of their workforce are women, at least half of their consumers, the people that they target to keep their companies afloat, to keep their CEO salaries going are women. So we are asking questions about resources at the stage. Now, Fatima, in your work as the strategy director of the Wraith Foundation, mm -hmm. what have you found to be some of the contributing causes to the increase in violence that we're observing? Well, if we talk about the recent increase, then obviously we're referring to the pandemic and the lockdown conditions. So again, here, yeah, the women's rights movement was very clear. We, we raised the alarm right at the beginning and said, actually, there is a crisis coming. We know that in the South African context, government has not done a good job of tracking gender-based violence in terms of statistics. So actually, in the South African context, we do not have a number. We can't tell you by exactly how much gender-based violence has increased, but it's completely logic that if you understand our country, if you understand the roots of the gender-based violence pandemic, that it's logical that in the context of a lockdown, where women will now be physically locked into a situation with the abuse, so that abuse numbers will increase. We've seen from other countries, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where they've done a better job of tracking it, that there was a massive escalation and spike in gender-based violence rates immediately when lockdown was introduced. So you don't have to be a scientist, you just have to apply logic that women can't leave their houses, they can't even make the call to that national toll-free number because he's in the house. And she can't physically get herself out to a police station at this time. And if you're a working class black woman in a township, chances are that you struggle to do that in any case. So the lockdown and the pandemic added another level of obstacle for women to be able to escape those abusive relationships and get the help they need to get there. And despite this, 
despite us raising this right from the beginning, there was very little put in place to ensure that women have the support. So what has actually happened on the ground, and this is what we see through our work around the country, it's been community-based organizations and women on the ground who've responded to the crisis. Often it's other poor women who are doing much more to carry and support survivors of gender-based violence through this process. So if we look at the recent Cape Town court case, we can see that the women outside the court are women from working class communities. It's women from Bridgetown, it's women from Enova Park who are saying that because they love the consequences of this pandemic every day, that they have a vested interest in fighting and making sure that um, accused do not get bail. And that's one of the big problems that when we switch on our TV and we listen to our political leaders, there's a very progressive sounding line that's coming through. We're hearing our president speak of patriarchy. These are all the right words. These are things that excite us because for a long time we didn't hear that vocabulary coming from our political leadership. The next challenge for them is to understand what it means practically in terms of a response and to really defer to civil society who has done, I think, a lot in the post-apartheid era to carry women through this pandemic. So for us, the corona pandemic is the second pandemic. It arrived in the pandemic of gender-based violence. And, and to us, the record high gender-based violence rate in the country, the fact that it's five times the national, the international global average tells us that there's something systemic, historic, and very complex happening. So there isn't, you know, we can throw all the perpetrators into prison, we can throw all the shelters, but at the heart of, of this crisis is the fact that we have a prevailing system, value system in our country that nurtures and reproduces patriarchy. And a key to that, to disrupting that, is to start showing consequences. We want to see the consequences to them, and we want to see publicly, and it must be on par with what has been promised to us. Absolutely, Fatima. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. But of course, stay with us yeah. as we continue to discuss this very important issue right now that is plaguing our nation. And we will do that with Fatima Shabudin a little bit later. It's my feel good work this year. It is your feel-good breakfast show indeed on this Monday morning. Thank you so much for choosing to wake up on the right side of bed this morning. Now still continuing the conversation with regards to gender-based violence, but also now taking it further with regards to shelters. Now the organizations that have been working on the ground tirelessly to battle the rise in gender-based and domestic violence during this lockdown period are the women's shelters who so often do incredible work with the most minimal of resources. Now joining us now via video call to share more about this is Kathy Cronier, the Vice Chair chairperson of the Western Cape Women's Shelter Movement and director of the Safe House. Good morning, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I mean, I want to get right into this conversation. You know, what kind of increased in gender based and domestic violence have you seen, you know, during this lockdown period? So um, physically seeing it in the shelters, in the first couple of weeks of lockdown, we were very, very quiet and really worried about what happened to gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And then when the president announced the first extension in lockdown, that's when people started coming out. And don't be mistaken, the, the violence never went away, but I think people were more scared of corona, of the unknown, so they just stayed at home and the violence continued at home. I think the biggest surge of violence that we saw was the minute um, the ban on alcohol was lifted. Within two or three days, every single first aid shelter in the Western Cape was virtually full. And so just on that topic, I would like to thank the president for um, mm. rebanning alcohol. It's the best thing he could have done for domestic violence at this stage. Mm. Now you're talking about, you know, so many people coming forward. Do these figures look the same across the country? Yes, I'm sure we, so I speak for the Western Cape, but we have seen the same figures throughout the country. Um, the surge that came through when the ban was lifted was unbelievable.
Mm. And I said that. You and know, also, the situations that the, that the women are coming out of. Remember that the men are very during lockdown were at home, so the women were trapped with them, and we had many cases of women not being able to reach out or get out or anything because the, the violator was still there with them, mm. and so we had many cases where we had to actually send saps in and try and get these women out. Hmm. I want to speak about that in just a second, but I also want to speak about the fact that women go to these shelters, you know, and many a time they are left with minimal resources. How have the shelters been able to, you know, cope with this increase in services needed? And again, how can the public support their local shelters? So um, we are just coping. The truth of the matter is that unless the, get, uh, unless the shelters get funding within the next two months, and I mean substantial f funding, uh, most of the shelters in the Western Cl Cape will have to close. We, uh, in the shelter movement, we are supported by the Department of Social Development, but that is only 40% of what sheltering was before the pandemic. The, with the pandemic, our, all of our shelter sheltering has increased and we definitely, definitely need funding and help towards that. Otherwise, we will have to close. Mm, that is the sad reality. And now I want to speak about the sad reality that a lot of the, the times the women has to go back into this environment, you know, since these women and families sometimes really have, you know, no option other than to go back to the abusive household. You know, what kind of interventions are being made in this regard then? So in the way the Western Cape Women Shelter Movement works very quickly is we've made four of the shelters first aid shelters and the rest of the shelters are normal sheltering where you can go for three or four months. So when you come into a shelter, you go into a first aid shelter and you're kept in isolation for 14 days. And this is um, a strategy that we've used to prevent the outbreak of corona in all our shelters because the last thing we need is all the shelters in quarantine due to corona and no woman would be able to access. So um, we have the first stage shelters and then we have second stage shelters. They come into the first stage shelters and their immediate needs are met. For example, medical needs, if they need protection orders, what we can do in the first 14 days, they de debrief de-traumatized, and then we send them on to second stage shelters. At the second stage shelters, work begins with the clients and the survivors go through ther therapy, they go through debriefing, individual therapy. And if the client, if there is absolutely no way for the client to go, then the social workers do do perpetrator intervention. And they try and sort something out with either the perpetrator or the family in order for it to be safer for the woman to go in. We also then try and give the woman the tools to see when it's going to reoccur and we give them a safety plan so that if something does happen, at least they know what to do. Well, thank you so much, Cathy Crenier, for giving us, you know, just insight with regards to the broader picture of what is happening in South Africa, more so in the Western Cape as well. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Now, the Western Cape Women's Shelter Movement forms part of a broader national network which works tirelessly both to protect victims of violence as well as advocate for their causes and raise the necessary funds to fulfill this important work. Now, to find out more about this, search for the National Shelter Movement of South Africa on Facebook right now to help someone that needs this. It's my feel-good work this show. This is your Feel Good Breakfast Show Express on SABC3. And as we continue to discuss relationships, or we have a dis uh, relationship discussion on a Monday, today we're asking the very important and big question, what can we do about gender-based violence in South Africa? And we're joined again via video call by feminist activist and strategy director of the Wraith Foundation, Fatima Shabuddin, to dive further into this topic. Thanks very much for staying with us, Fatima. Now, if I had to ask you the question, why are victims of abuse afraid to come forward during this time? And is there anything that we can do to encourage them to seek help and to, to better protect them? 
I think it's important as a starting point to recognize that victims have always been afraid to come forward. So the pandemic has exacerbated that fear. But we do have all the evidence here that illustrates why people are so afraid, because the first port of call usually is the police station. So if you go into any police station now and you actually engage with those police officers and check their prevailing values around gender, mm-hmm. we know that it's undisputed that there's high rates of gender-based violence by police officers. We've got a horrific rate of, of police officers killing their own partners, themselves being implicated in femicide. So the reality is that if the place that you're going to very much resembles the house that you come from, there's not much of an incentive for you to go and report because what you're going to experience is secondary victimization. Someone's going to blame you, ask you what clothes you were wearing, what you were, what you did to anger the man. And there isn't the kind of value system that actually unconditionally supports women and believes them as a starting point. Mm. So that is the challenge that we face with, which is why a big part of the challenge in dealing with gender-based violence is to try and use our public broadcasting systems to recraft the prevailing values in our country around gender-based violence. And it's not only about violence, it's about things like how men uh, behave in homes. You know, the fact that by and large, in our households, there are very patriarchal divisions of labor. Women pull the long shifts, they work in they have their daytime jobs, women who are employed, and come on to another full-time shift, which also means it takes women out of the public domain. We can't occupy the spaces in political and social community activist spaces that where our voices are most needed. So for me, also an important part of the conversation, although it sounds benign, is about women, men's responsibility in households. If you sleep in a bed and you're a man, you have to make that bed. If you If you made children, you have to raise children. If you're eating in a house, you have to contribute to cooking and cleaning. You know, there are many men who don't do any of that. But when you talk to them about gender-based violence, they are outraged and incensed about the idea of men killing our women. But they don't know the extent to which they are themselves contributing to to reproducing a value system that doesn't value women's contribution. So if there's anything that comes out of this, the focus on gender-based violence, it's about the... um, revising, we need a revolution in our personal conduct that's not about externalizing the gender-based violence crisis to to the men who rape and kill because part of our challenge is when we talk to men, and I know this is the case in my life, all the men that I know think that gender-based violence is something that other men perpetrate. It's not their problem. So we think of these men as monsters. They are the aberrations in our communities. But the reality is we don't have enough prison space for all the men who rape and murder in our country. That And, you know, so prison, while it's a response to keeping women safe, is not the long-term solution. Incarceration doesn't take us out of the crisis. It is a, a much more complex project about shifting value systems. And in that regard, our role modeling by leadership is very important. So we hear all the very, you know, when I listen to our president, I think we were all moved because it sounds as if you're listening to a man who rules a country who actually understands the extent of violence. And our president shows some level of embarrassment to be from that gender, responsible for the loss of so many lives. Yet we don't see that same president acting decisively when they, when they, when they found fine men in their own political ranks guilty of perpetrating gender-based violence. And of course, a big part of it is the legal system. It's what's happening in police stations. It's what happens in churches. It's what happens in our courts. Fatima, what strategies can you and someone who's in distress employ to seek help if it's not as simple or easy as going into a shelter or police station? I think the first, we all know the slogan to break the silence. And I think that is really the first thing that we that if you're in a situation, if you're a woman who's in an abusive space and you're hearing this right now, the most important thing is to talk to someone as soon as possible. It could be neighbors, it could be family, it could be there's lots of NGOs, there's a national toll-free line. But I do think part of what we need to do is for us, for the rest of us who are not in that space, to become much more attentive to women around us, to see it as our responsibilities to intervene and to reach out because often it's very difficult for women to do that when they're in that space. Talk to us about how we can go about encouraging our men to be part of the solution as well. Well, I think it goes beyond encouraging them. Is I think men must, because we hear 
lots of men saying that this is not in their name. They don't, you know, this doesn't represent them. And so we are left asking ourselves, so who's standing, who's doing all the raping and the killing if we hear so many men saying this is not us? And it does mean that we're asking male, men to exercise their patriarchal powers as men to intervene in our lives, to intervene in the conduct of other men, to be disruptive when you sit in a company and you hear sexist jokes or any kind of conduct that normalizes the humiliation and the exploitation of women. We need men to stop being comfortable and quiet in those spaces and to speak out. At the same time, we're asking men to understand that when people are oppressed like women are, it is our struggle that we need to lead and we need men to support our leadership in this. We don't want men to think that they can come and save us because that is exactly the patriarchal formula that got us into the trouble in the first place. So for men, it's important to learn to listen, to be quiet and to actually follow the leadership of, of women in this regard. And I think that would be a great exercise in unlearning patriarch if men actually succeeded in doing that. Oh, Fatima Shabuddin, uh, Wraith Foundation Strategy Director, thank you very much for your incredibly valuable contribution to this topic and, and discussion this morning. Now, the Department of Social Development South Africa has a gender-based violence command centre which operates a national 24-7 call centre facility. Now, they have multiple ways in which to contact them for help, primarily the emergency line 0800 428 428. But you can also visit gbv.org.za to find uh, other methods as well as gain insight into the important work that they do.